Are we good? Can you hear me? Am I on? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Um, good day. Uh, how do you do, fellow kids? Thank you so much for coming to this uh, Life is Strange, the Blue Age of Storytelling. I feel like my voice is a little extra crispy loud, but um, that's just my paranoia and nervousness. Um, thank you for coming to this panel on Life is Strange, what I call the Blue Age of Storytelling. My name is Christian Devine. I was the head writer for the game uh, Life is Strange, published by Square Enix and produced by the amazing Don't Nod Entertainment. I'm giving myself a few get out of um jail free cards. So that's just, if you hear an um, it just means I've passed off one of those cards. Um, so to start, let's start from the beginning and uh, because it's uh, because we're talking about uh, narrative and dramatic structure, the talk is going to be basically broken down into three acts. Act one is the intro, where I'll talk about myself, background, how I came to work for Life is Strange. Act two, we're going to go into an actual anatomy of a scene. We're going to take a major scene from Life is Strange and uh, analyze it and show the levels of writing and design and POV that went into it, and maybe how all these different characters choreographed creates a really strong emotional scene and a strong narrative scene. And the final act is called the Feel Simulator, and we'll talk a bit about the emotional response to Life is Strange the, and the unexpected to us emotional response, even though that's what we hoped for, and how maybe we did that and maybe how we didn't do that. And so, first off, um, my dad was, I'll start from the background, this is G-Force, gotcha man. No, I love these pants here because they're so 70s. It's hilarious. That's me on the far right. My dad was in the military, so I'm what's known in America as a military brat, meaning we moved around constantly because my dad served in Vietnam. And when he wasn't in Vietnam, we were just at different bases. From I was born in New York, so we'd go from New York to Florida to South Carolina, Wyoming, Columbus, all over Monterey. I was born with one hand, what the uh, doctors at the time call a congenital birth defect. There's no real reason or explanation. It, uh, I don't ask for any sympathy or even barely empathy because, of course, when you're, everybody knows this, who's, everybody's got their own shell on their back. Either it's an ex exterior shell or it's an interior shell. And we, we all carry the shell with us. And mine just happens to be exterior. And it, early on, I learned that I was different. And I learned early on that I had to be smarter and better prepared to deal with society because they're always going to be like, oh, oh, poor baby, oh, you can't do this, oh. I can do everything but juggle. And fortunately, it just does not come up. And since Donald Trump is not going to become president, I don't have to worry about juggling. Just letting you know as an ambassador from America. <laughs> and one of the most important things I learned very early on, my brother Scott, was a big influence on me because he was a few years older and I was always the, yeah, where are you going, where are you going, where are you going, which he loved. And, but he was the cultural influence on me and so he, he exposed me to all the cool cultural things that I, that I needed to be exposed to as a kid. And Bruce Lee was one of my early heroes and Bruce Lee's quote, one of his, my favorite quotes is, make your disadvantage your advantage. And that's what I learned early on about my arm. You know, you, you use whatever you have but if it's not, perfect, take that and try to apply it to an, uh, the system and make it work. For example, I will use Life is Strange as an example. Life is Strange obviously was not a triple-A game, didn't have the big budget, but it's very lo-fi, and so instead of trying to compete with massive photorealism and incredible graphics, they use a totally different art style, a painterly, very beautiful, handcrafted art style. And it's a lo-fi aesthetic, but it works, and it fits, it fits the aesthetic of the game. And I think in what's going on right now in, in, in gaming is that you're going to have all these new eras of aesthetic coming in, because it's a very young industry. We're very, it's 30 years old when you look at it. And it's, if you compare that to the film industry or literature or anything, you can see what a very small timeline that is. And so, but the acceleration is very rapid of the technology. And I think technologically, we're there. I mean, games, I mean, VR is the next thing, but boy, graphically, to go from Pong to WoW is pretty incredible in, in only a 30-year period. 
So this is a map of Rockland, California. It's pure suburbia. Oh, wait a minute. That's actually the back cover of the Rush album, Signals, because the song Subdivisions is, was a defining album in my life because you know, one of the lines of the song uh, Subdivisions is, nowhere is the misfit or the dreamer more alone. And that's a feeling that every artist has or anybody who wants to go beyond you know, feels. So culturally, I I'm I'm consider myself a media baby. And I, I sponged up everything as a kid. I was a huge Godzilla fan, huge, you know, monster movie fan. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an animator. I really, Ray Harryhausen was one of my heroes, so I dreamed of being a stop motion animator. And I did a lot of stop motion, but I realized, boy, you really need a lot of discipline. And it's not a field that there's a huge amount of people that it can succeed in. And I moved on to drawing and art. Jack Kirby is, is, my, is my new god in terms of artist. And you can see Kirby's work. Today. I mean, the Marvel Universe all came from Jack Kirby. Stan Lee did write it, but Jack Kirby created everything. And, and the power of that mythos and the power of that myth-making you know, really influenced me. Early on, my brother gave me Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury that changed my life. I love Bradbury's writing because I was never into hard... I read the hard science fiction, but I was never... I didn't really care about how the rocket ship worked, and neither did Ray Bradbury. He was like, they get in a rocket ship, they fly to Mars, that's it. That's the science of Ray Bradbury. So there was a poetry to his fantasy, but his bent was more social issues and how people deal with the future with, you know, with their own morality. Dandelion wine, romantic, October country, the darkness of the melancholy of October that Bradbury is so beautiful at. And, you know, growing up, Judy Bloom was a huge influence on me. She's a very, do you know who Judy Bloom is out there? She's the most famous young adult author in America all up until recently. She's still famous. And she's the first young adult author to actually present issues of bullying and, and what you go through is puberty and in an honest way. Her books are very controversial. They're often banned. Blubber was a very successful, very controversial book about a, a young girl who's picked on enormously because of her weight. It's an incredibly cruel, mean book. Not because she's cruel and mean, because kids are cruel and mean. And she, she just, we love these books because these were our classmates. And when I was 10 years old, I saw this movie called Star Wars. And Star Wars, you know, I hate to say, yeah, it changed my life, but yeah, Star Wars changed my life. Because when I sat in that theater and the Star Destroyer went overhead, the entire audience cheered. Now, one thing we don't quite have anymore in movies is this communal feeling. Yes, people applaud and they laugh and they cheer, but Star Wars brought back this immense audience involvement. So the entire time, people are cheering and laughing and literally almost standing on their seat. And I don't think anybody today can quite imagine that response. And it was a very typical audience response. So the moment that Luke Skywalker goes out and looks out the binary sunset, that is a brilliant myth-making moment. Lucas di didn't even really know what he was doing in that moment because that's the moment that he's saying to every dreamer, every artist that's looking out there, like, where is my place? Where am I going? And I, at that point, I said, I'm going somewhere. I want to be an artist, and I'm heading out towards that future. Now, one of my other heroes is Jean Cocteau, who's a French artist, very famous French artist. And he always said that art is a marriage of the unconscious and the conscious meaning that when you're creating art, you need to be relying, you can't be analytical because you just won't get far. And that's why most people stop writing. They're like, oh, well, I was writing, but I had to, I keep editing, which is what I started doing. But no, you have to let the shit out. You cannot edit it. You wait till afterwards to be analytical. So you have to be really pure about that. And my influences are so great. And when I'm talking about um, the blue age of storytelling, I'm kind of talking about a cultural change we had. I was a huge anime fan, obviously, Getchaman, big influence, Captain Harlock, and of course, this is satire, Mad Magazine. For me, Mad Magazine taught me very, very early on not to trust anything I saw, and I still don't. I, it's just how I am. I just know that, you know, that there's a lot of manipulation going, and I'm very, also as a writer, I'm very aware of how things work a bit, so I'm very, like, I, I make sure that I'm, I'm checking everything. Of course, you know, I became a huge fan of Monster Magazines, H.R. Giger, you know, these, all these weird influences really created me. Fantasy books, Conan, and Heavy Metal when I started hitting puberty, I'm like, oh, oh, there's some naked bodies in here and violence, cool. And I also grew up with John Romero. He was my uh, best friend since 10 years old, and we were 
a couple of really mean kids in terms of, of what we were doing artistically because we start breaking the rules and National Lampoon magazine broke all these scary rules. And this is a page from a story called Boy's Wrath by John Hughes who later created Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles. But before he was John Hughes, he was writing the most merciless, terrifying stories about suburban youth. And, and we kind of all intook that. Ian Fleming, James Bond, huge influence on me. And then, of course, games. Monopoly, for some reason, I was obsessed with as a kid. I don't know why. I always wanted Baltic Avenue and Mediterranean. I would get hotels on there and go bankrupt within, you know, two plays. And Donkey Kong really changed my life. A, I love the name Donkey Kong. There's, it's the two weirdest words put together ever, and it fits perfectly. And me and John would spend hours at the arcade. I turned the Donkey Kong machine over, and I was instantly always huge in arcade games and always attracted to the visual and even the narrative qualities. Like, oh, come on, Mario, get up there, get up, get up there. And then, uh, when I was about 12, I started reading about Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy magazines in the back of counterculture magazines. And I, I didn't know, I, wow, this is like a, a board game, but you get to have narrative, you get to talk and, be, and have dialogue and essay characters. And so Dungeons and Dragons is, is the biggest storytelling influence on me, and it really taught me story in a way, because when you're sitting at the table, you have to really come up with things, because it's all built around players' decisions, and you don't know what, you may have a map, you may have a guy, but you don't know what the players are going to do. So it really taught me to think about story and narrative, and then I could A, say all the roles of the characters, and it was just a huge influence on me. And even games like Car Wars by Steve Jackson, which I totally adore, this is not a picture of me and my friends, but it sure could be. It's pretty much the archetypal picture of all the kids, you know, playing D&D &D in the day. And as a writer, I started, the first script I ever read was Alien. And this is the scene right here. This is the, the original description of the alien coming out of Kane's chest. And I absolutely was fascinated by the writing style. If you look at it, it's dot, 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 dot. And Walter Hill rewrote uh, Dan O'Bannon's script. And Walter Hill, who wrote The Warriors and 40 Hours and a lot of films, he had a really amazing screenwriting style. It's kind of like a haiku. And just a red stain, then a smear of blood blossoms, the fabric of his shirt is ripped open, the crew shouts in panic. You know, it's just bop, 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 bop. And Ridley Scott read the script in half an hour. He, bought, he wanted to do it immediately just because of the way the script was written. So that was a big influence. And, of course, Stephen King, when I read The Shining, blew me away and terrified me. And I was a huge Stephen King fan. And I read everything. Harlan Ellison taught me how to question and stand up for myself as a kid because he's a very famous writer. Harlan Ellison wrote the most famous episode of Star Trek, the original Star Trek, called The City on the Edge of Forever, which is referenced in Life is Strange, of course. Kirk has to go back in time and he falls in love. In order to change time, he has to let the woman he loves die. So it, it's, a, and it's the best episode of Star Trek, and it's my favorite. Ignore Ayn Rand's politics, but her writing to me was amazing, and, and her writing style changed my life because she had a really beautiful way of encapsulating ideas and emotion and in a way that I thought that I'd never read anybody do before, and I, I highly advise you, if you're interested in just dialogue, just to read her dialogue. Ignore her politics, but just read what she's writing because it's truly amazing writing. William Gibson, huge fan, because he was the first person to like predict the cyberspace where we're at now, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing achievement. My first published, the first time I was ever published in a magazine was Fangoria, the first time The Evil Dead was ever mentioned in any media. So I'm very proud that my, it was for a Draw the Thing contest from John Carpenter. So I, I made it to one of the 100 finalists out of 4,000 entries. And that also said, I said, huh, maybe I have something going on here. Maybe I can, maybe there's a, maybe there's a way for me in this world. Um, I'm a big fan of Marshall McLuhan, talking about the media, because the media is, is somewhat of my subtext, and, and I believe that a lot of my viewpoints are filtered through what goes on in the media, and I also believe it's the most powerful force in the world outside of politics. And it does change and transforms people's lives, and it hypnotizes them and inspires them. And so all of these cultural influences, I always say nothing is wasted. You, it, it doesn't hurt to have every arrow in your quiver. Don't think anything that you do, like, oh, I'm interested in this, but I'm interested in that. You never know where that one thing that you think is not going to mean anything is going to come up and actually mean something. So let's get a bit to what I call the Blue Age. Now, the New Age, it was the term from the 60s and 70s 
this holistic movement that was a response against Western kind of imperialism and capitalism, and it led to this holistic spiritual movement in the 70s and 80s, and then strangely enough led to Yanni and, and record stores. Um, next to Tangerine Dream, what does not Yanni and Tangerine Dream do not belong together? Brian Eno. I'm a huge, huge ambient instrumental music fan. So, but to me, we're moving. I realized quickly early on. I mean, blue is the color of cool. It's the color of monitors. It's the color of the screen. The 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 primary color in Blade Runner is blue. And the first Apple ad, blue. And I got the first uh, Macintosh, and I was I, it transformed my writing life instantly because I was writing on typewriters, and I could write on a typewriter, but I did not want to. It took forever, and to correct something, you had to go into it. So, when the computer came along, I was all over this. It, it changed my writing life, and I was like, okay, I can instantly delete and correct. And I got the first screenwriting software, and I started writing. I got the first Sony Handycam, and the night that I actually came up with the phrase, the Blue Age, I was looking through the lens, I was having an, an epiphany, maybe under controlled substances or not, I'm not saying, but it doesn't, you don't question where epiphanies come from, but I realized that the future is, was going to be through monitors, and when you walk down the street, what's the color you see from all the rooms? Blue, 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 light, blue light, blue light. People looking down, blue light, blue light, blue light, blue light. So we're moving into this POV of screens and mirrors and reflection and refraction. And by the way, these, this theory is just theory. The theory is theory. It's not canon. You can say this guy's full of shit, and that's okay, because it's just a theory. I went to Berkeley, so I was saying this is full of shit about all sorts of theories. But I love learning them because I do think it, you, it adds. When I was uh, 25... That was my 64 Cadillac. I needed to change my life because I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't going forward. I wasn't, I wasn't moving in the direction that I needed to move into. And so I went back to school. I changed my life completely, moved down to Southern California, enrolled back in school. I knew I had, you know, I thought I had some raw talent, but I had no discipline. And I, I won, I entered it, but the first writing thing I ever entered was a national uh, play contest. And I ended up being one of the 100 finalists out of 5,000 people. And that was literally the sign that I was looking for from the universe. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe this will happen. When I went back to school, it was wonderful. I had great teachers. They inspired me. And they taught me the best thing I learned about school is the platonic knowledge. Just know when you don't know. And I, I, I use that rule to this day. Just know when you don't know. It's okay to not know. There's nothing wrong with that. You'll learn. Or you'll figure it out. Or you won't. It's okay. And then while I was at Berkeley... Uh, John Romero, who had already, of course, become John Romero through Doom, called me up and said the magic words, hey, do you want to come write for my new game? And I said, let me think about it. I'll think about it. And then, then my apartment burned down, and I was in Texas a week later. So life worked out. We can talk about Daikatana and Ion Storm on another lecture. That's a whole other story. But it was an amazing experience, and I learned a lot about game development, working with the team, and also... It was a very early indicator because the online world was still very early in of how very toxic the online world could be when it didn't like something. And I never forgot that moment. I still have not forgot that moment. And then at a certain point, Hollywood came a call in for my scripts, and so I moved to Los Angeles and started selling scripts and optioning scripts and writing for games and writing for everybody who wanted me to write for them. And it was wonderful because you're just you're working through this entire system. And this, I, this is one of my, every screenwriter has the dream of being in a variety. And when I uh, optioned my script, 18 Wheel Butterfly, uh, they did the, with Evan Rachel Wood signed on board to play the lead. And Michael Polish, a director who happened to go to my same high school in Rockland along with John, ended up attaching himself as a director. So from there, I've been thinking like, God, I really want to get back into games. I've been missing, I, 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 I kind of left the game world in a way because I thought like it was a little bit stagnant and I, it needed new blood and it also needed to go through growing pains. It was a little bit too, it was just a little bit too boyish, let's put it that way. And I was waiting for that change over to come. And then when my friend David Calvo, a French writer, who is my, it's always good to have a French cheerleader. He had heard they were looking for a writer for this new game. And so he recommended me. And I ended up connecting with Michelle, the, the co-director, and they sent over uh, the menu and some clips from the game. And this is the first thing I saw from Life is Strange, with, with the menu moving and that little piece of music. And I knew immediately, I knew immediately. I said, 
this is awesome. I get it. I get it. I don't even know what the game's about. I get what they're doing. I get the tone they're going for. And Brenda Romero, who on the faculty invited me to speak here today, she said, well, you should, you know, for your test, because every game company gives you a test usually. And the tests are not always indicative of what you can do as a writer. Sadly, it's like, just like describe the scepter. Okay. There's, there's, you know, there's only so many ways you can describe a scepter. But for Twine, it was a, it's a, for anybody using Twine at all? It's such a, I highly recommend it. It's for just in terms of building story blocks. And when I started using it, I was like, wow, this is like narrative Legos. Oh, that's what a great phrase, narrative Legos. I was so proud of myself when I watched a GDC lecture with Ken Levine talking about narrative Legos from like two years earlier. That's okay, great minds. And so th you can see like, this is the branching dialogue of the, of the Twine. And you can see the level, how detailed and how many, it goes up. And that's part of the problem with branching dialogue for people is you have to think not only just one linear, you have to think of all the tangents. And you, that's a trick for some writers. And that's why a lot of screenwriters don't really do well in games because they don't quite understand the concept of branching dialogue and how to do it. But you can see, you, just, you, you, know, you, can see you keep moving in and it's, you're able to go to one here and one here. And this is the very first mention of the word hella. In the, this is for the test that I gave them, and they 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 were sold <laughs> just on, on the word hella. So I had a Skype interview. They loved what I did for the test. The test was totally not like a test. It was simply felt like it was made for me. And then two weeks after I took it, I was in Paris, and Paris was wonderful. And what's even more amazing to show you the the curve of life, how strange it how strange it is, is that this is the Rue, uh, Rue Raymond. Say this for me, please. Messi, who happened to be Jean Cocteau's lover and one of his mentors. So the fact that I was actually working on this street, I, I just felt like the, there's no accidents. And this is just a glimpse of us doing some voice recording in the studio. Uh, this is me letting, the, letting me, I bug them, I beg them to let me do a cameo voice because I'm a, even though I'm not an actor, I love I to ham it up sometimes. So. They let me say the part of Trust Limbo, the radio talk show host. In, in the, every, does everyone remember that fan, fantastic scene, with Trust Limbo? Okay, yeah, I thought so. Um, it's right before Nathan has his amazing message. But um, it was really, it's a great experience because you get to learn once again. Everybody should learn how voice actors work. If you're a writer, you need to know, you need to be writing for actors, and you need to think about actors, and you need to have respect for actors because it's, it's an incredibly hard job. My very last day in Paris after writing Life is Strange for two years, I had to take that famous one last shot in the rain. <laughs> it was sad. I was crying. I was feeling it. I had the feels. And the game, the first episode had already dropped. And the first night the first episode dropped, of course, I sat down. I was visiting actually my hometown in Rockland where I grew up. And I was by myself. And I realized, like, oh, shit, the entire world is about to judge me. And it's, it's kind of a scary feeling. And then when I started watching it, I just was like, you know, you're watching the Twitches, the Twitch streams. And I was, and I could tell by about 10 o'clock that night, I, this is not ego, by the way. This is just me saying, I just said, I think it's going to be a hit. I think it's going to work. And I just felt really good because I could see people responding to it. Even the people, you know, and of course there are people that were responding to it negatively. So the first night I'm watching the, the chat stream, one of the comments is, I wish I could go back in time and give the writer's mom an abortion. Now, you could say that is darkly funny, and I probably would. It's, it's, I can handle it. It's just, it's, but who does that? Who says that? Why do they do that? And, and it made me think, because the point of Life is Strange is also how the social media bullying affects young people. And I, and I, of course it would. It's terrible to have to deal with that. And, and the scope that young people today have to deal with this you know, it's very powerful and, it, and it's psychologically very damaging. So I was really proud that the game was able to impress upon people and we were able to move forward in terms of storytelling and, and have deal with these issues, you know, abortion and suicide and, you know, just making, busting your friend for weed, these moral decisions that the game forced you to make. I, it was just taking games in a direction that I was just always excited to go for and I was so happy and so humbled that the fandom and the critical acclaim came next and it was just a really you, you don't always get that you don't get that very much and so you're happy if you if you get it at all and we were all overjoyed to get it 
you know, I said early on, I really hope we were going to get some BAFTAs. We got uh, five BAFTA nominations and we won for story. And just getting the awards is fantastic. It, it's, just, it's just approbation from the community and the fandom responding to the game and sending us their cosplay and their messages and people saying that I was going to kill myself, but I played Life is Strange and I decided not to. Um, it's powerful. It's powerful. And I, you know, the fans always blame us for giving them the feels, but I'm like, no, you give us the feels. That's, that's really what it's all about. And GDC, uh, early this year we got the Audience Award, which is really wonderful. And for me, one of the great honors we got was the Peabody Award. The first Peabody Award for, the, for a video game. The Peabody Award is basically the electronic communication equivalent of the Pulitzer, which I kind of said, boy, I really think we should get the Pulitzer <laughs> for Life is Strange. Uh, my ego is not in check at this point. But we got the Peabody, and I got to go to the ceremony, accept it, and it was really wonderful because I got to tell John Stewart and Keegan Key about Life is Strange, and they were both, sh everybody was like, a video game? What? Huh? A video game about a Peabody? Like, that's really, like, huh? The video game? Which shows you the, the mindset that people have about video games. A couple months ago, I got to meet John Carpenter, and hell, he's a huge fan of Don't Nod's Remember Me. So I brought a copy of Life is Strange to have him sign for the team and take a photo, and we talked about Remember Me, and he said he would play Life is Strange. So it just shows you how far I came from this point as a child, just wanting to be involved in media, to actually being involved. And the best part of the story is when I went back to school later on and I was winning some awards for writing, I ended up w meeting Ray Bradbury and for a contest I'd won. And so they asked to take a picture f for us. And I stood next to Ray Bradbury. For some reason, he reached out and he grabbed my hand and he squeezed it for the picture. And I really felt like he was blessing me. He was saying, I'm giving you some energy. I'm, I, I believe in you. I know it. You did it. Go. I just felt so like moved. So that's basically my background and how I came to write for Life is Strange. Let's segue into the clinical part of the discussion, which is anatomy of a scene. So we're going to watch a scene here from Life is Strange. It's, it's a spoiler alert, by the way. Spoiler, this is not a major spoiler, but it, so you're okay. But this is a pretty big pivotal scene in the, in the third episode. Hold on, make sure this is okay. In the third episode, where David Madsen, the uh, overzealous security guard, has come back to his house complaining because two, some punks had broken into the school the night before. Those punks were his stepdaughter, Chloe, and the lead character, Max, who were looking for clues for the mystery. So this is a scene where all the characters, they've been very antagonistic, and this is kind of the pivotal moment where Max gets to finally confront David for being an asshole. And what I love about the game is that, yes, David's an asshole, but he's, maybe he's not. And, and people can decide for themselves how they feel about him or Chloe. So let's watch the scene and we'll discuss the making of it afterwards. Let's hope this works. Nice breakfast. David, you, you back already? I have to take a nap after writing up vandalism reports last night. What happened? Some little shit-ass punks broke into the swimming pool. This is what happens at these PC bullshit colleges. Entitled students taking over the campus. Do you know for sure it was Blackwell students? Who else would do it? And I'm gonna bust them. <sighs> Figures you'd be here. Is that your Rachel Amber Halloween costume? You know more about her than me. No. You and Chloe think you know more than anybody. Like all teenagers. Leave Max alone, David. Stop threatening students. He threatens them with surveillance cameras so he can spy on everybody. Like he spies on all of us here. Don't start, Chloe. Not now. Yeah, I'm just always starting shit, right? You're a total paranoid, David. Not now, Chloe. You used to call me a loser for getting kicked out of Blackwell. So who's the loser now, David? Who haven't you accused or harassed? Between your investigations into Rachel and Kate, what have you done besides get in trouble? We're siding with uh, Chloe in this one. You're a bully, David. I saw you harass Kate Marsh when she was going through hell. You could have totally helped her. 
Everybody at Blackwell is a suspect to you, except for Nathan Prescott. That's why the students and faculty don't like you. You even threatened me. I do respect your service, but you don't respect anybody. Uh, you were smoking pot in Chloe's room. That's illegal. So is spying on people in your family and at your work. Why do you have photos of Kate Marsh and Rachel Amber in your files anyway? What? Is this true, Max? Yes, David. Why do you have these files at all? I find this very disturbing. I do not have to take this kind of interrogation. Not from you punks. Maybe you should calm down. Oh, you're turning on me now, huh? Of course. Women always stick together. Well, screw you. David, you better go to a hotel until we figure this out. You can't kick me out of my own home. It's my home, David. Paid for and in my name. You know the law, right? Oh, I, I thought I knew a lot of things. Like when I'm outflanked. Have a nice day. Chloe, for once, just please shut up. I hope Joyce doesn't hate me for tearing into David. I don't want to see or hear you again, Max. You've hurt me and my family enough. Okay, so... What I love, this is actually my favorite scene in the game, and I have a lot of favorite scenes in the game. And the team is so amazing. I mean, what they put together is so incredible, and I was always, always amazed at the work they were doing, the artist and the musicians and the directors and Michelle and Raul and everybody just firing on all cylinders. And it's not often you get to work on a team where you, re you really feel like you're all on the same page, but I really feel like we were all on the same page. And so what I loved about uh, that scene is is just the is just that Joyce, who I feel like is kind of like the most underrated character in the game in a way, and one of my favorite characters. She just doesn't. She never really gets the good end of the stick, but she finally gets to tell David what's what. I really love that, and I love Max saying to David, "I respect your service, but you don't respect anybody because David served in the military." And so that's an important point to make that Chloe does understand that David went through hell, and he's seen horrors that she can't comprehend, but. David doesn't mean it gives him the right to hold up his hand to his daughter or anybody. And my favorite, probably my favorite article that anybody wrote about Life is Strange was from a lieutenant in Afghanistan. And he said that David Madsen is the best veteran character in the history of video games. Let's take that. I'll take that as a compliment. So as a writer, what I love doing is entering different POVs. And one of my big writing epiphanies was when I wrote my first script called, not my first script, but my fourth script called Little Girl Lost. And it was the first time that I decided to not be Christian Divine. I was always Christian Divine. And I was like, God, I'm kind of bored of being Christian Divine. Let's, I'm tired of hearing myself think and talk the same way. So I thought, let's write from a different point of view, of two sisters, two females on the run. And as a writer, you do write all sorts of different characters. You know, somebody, you know, I met, I went for a meeting one time and they said, well, what do you know about writing, you know, a female truck driver? I said, well, I probably know as much as J.K. Rowling does about a boy wizard. You know, I know as much as Shakespeare knows about two uh, lovers in eternal love. You know, it's, it's a kind of a silly question because when you're, when you're writing, you're, it's up to the, I mean, you have to convince the, the viewer, the reader, or the audience that you're convincing them. So, the, you know, that's the trick. It doesn't mean you can, you can try it, you can do it, but... When you're writing different points of view, you know, I put myself in that character's mindset. When I'm writing David Madsen, I'm like, you PC entitled college punks. And then on a Max, I'm like, you asshole, you don't know anything about the world. You know, so you, you have to be, I like to be fair to all the characters. And the point of Life is Strange is, in fact, this kind of empathy for people to look at what they're going through. It doesn't mean you have to say approve of them, but you look at what they're going through. So that's just an example of how you kind of you know, put these characters together and have them, you know, kind of dance around. Um, let's go on to this section, the field simulator. So, probably the most amazing thing about the game for all of us, I can probably say, is just the, the level of emotional response that the players, you know, gave us. And, and watching people on Let's Plays and Twitches crying, I mean, we were writing, we were hoping to give them those emotions, but we, it was hard to believe that I don't think anybody knew that we would tap into this, and I'm not sure. I'm still not sure why. But I think, as part of this Blue Age, I think it's because a you're you are involved in Max's personality. You're playing Max, so you're within that world. So of course you you there's a bonding there within that screen. There's a bonding going on. So I think that's what what gives you this kind of emotional connection to the characters. 
And so, you know, just once again, just as a small example of the outpouring of amazing fan art. And once again, to me, the greatest tribute for Life is Strange for me is when somebody sends me a picture of, of them drawing a character in class, ignoring the teacher, which is exactly what I did. And John Romero is in front of me coding when I was 15 and I was drawing comics. And they're drawing Helen and Chloe, so she's got a great future ahead of her, I can, I can already see. So for this section, I want to quickly in, go through a couple, uh, some clips just to show you maybe how we layer emotional weight within characters. And they're tangents. They're not necessarily big pivotal emotional scenes, but they're like emotional building blocks, and they build up to how you, how you respond to the character. So this is, this is the introduction of... Uh, what up, Max? How are you? Warren. Here's your flash. Thanks. No problem. So you saw that he reached in for the hug there, and he didn't get the hug. He got the flash drive. And originally the script just called for Warren to, you know, lean in and, and kiss Max on the cheek, but culturally that's, we don't do that in America, so common. And so based on Warren's kind of cringy, clinging character, you know, I thought it's much funnier to do this go for the hug thing. And they just nailed the, the style of it. It's so great. But that really, def that moment defines Warren for so many people because people are like friend zone. Okay, now we know friend zone. <laughs> so, <laughs> poor Warren. And, 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 the, and there is a lot of people that get really don't like Warren. And I, and I tend to think some of it is they can certainly not like Warren because of the writing, that's fine. I, or or some, in some ways I think Warren reminds some people too much of themselves, you know, a bit, uh, including me. So, but it's okay because, you know, Warren's a teenager and that's how teenagers are sometimes. So this is what another section, this is what they call the, what Michelle and Raul call the Zen moments where Max would sit down and have these little contemplative moments to think about what's going on. The lighthouse looks so mysterious. I wish I could stay in this moment forever. I guess I actually can now. But then it wouldn't be a moment. I really like that line. I'm, you know, I mean, as a writer, you, you know, you're your you're worst critic. And trust me, I can read criticism of Life is Strange, and, you know, I, we all do. And so you're your own worst critic, and you know what works and what doesn't work for you. And there are moments they're writing things that you should be happy for and proud of because that's kind of what you're doing. You should like what you're doing. Hopefully you enjoy whatever, if you're designing or writing or drawing, hopefully you do love what you're doing, and you, and you pat yourself on the back once in a while because the world is not going to that often as an artist. That's just the, that's the cautionary and I tell people that. Get ready. You know, you better develop a very thick skin if you're going to be an artist because the world doesn't care. They don't care if you write or draw or paint or design. They just don't care. You have to make them care. That's your job. And then hopefully they will care. This is another little moment that I really, really like. Why look, an otter in my water. Dun, 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 dun. You are so obvious. And I still get freaked out by that movie, so stop. I can't even watch any of those shark shows. Now in the script, Michelle and Raul really wanted this. This is the last moment between Max and Chloe that's really quiet and bonding. And Michelle and Raul, the, the directors, you know, they were very specific about, about the intent of the scene and, what they, and the emotional level they wanted to create. And Michelle was like, you know, we want to have them splashing water, you know. And it's, a, it's what kids do, everybody does when they jump in the pool. And I thought, you know, every, there's probably not anybody who doesn't jump into a pool that doesn't start going dun, 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 dun. I mean, it's just, it's, Jaws might be the most, you know, recognizable musical theme of all time. There, there, could, there could be an argument made for that. And it just, it's just a little moment, and then she goes, I don't even like to watch those shark shows, which is a reference to all these endless shark shows they seem to have on TV in America and I'm sure around the world. So it's just, it's a cultural, you know, part of the, what, the layering of Life is Strange emotionally is the cultural references. And, and just to, it makes people identify, it helps people like, oh, I know that, I see that, I get that. And not to overdo it, in a way, but because Life is Strange is set in art college, they are purposely overdone because I've been, I went to UC Berkeley and that's all you do. You're dropping names all day long. You're talking pop culture, everything. So this is a, this clip is a moment in an alternate universe when Chloe is actually in a wheelchair and she's talking with Max. Max, thanks for coming out to see me. You're, you're doing awesome. I don't think so. Um, my, my nose is getting cold. Maybe we should get back to my place? It is hella cold out here. Hella? I hate that word, no offense. None taken.
Now, nobody says hello. This is uh, something that comes up in the game. And part of what I was really excited about writing Life is Strange for, I'm very familiar with in Pacific Northwest. I go up to Oregon, Portland, Seattle all the time, and I'm there all the time. And as a Northern California boy, the word hella is probably one of the most indige indigenous expressions you'll hear. And it's been around forever and ever. And around 2013, I noticed that young people around me were saying it again. It was so funny. I was like, wow, people are saying hella again. You know, I haven't heard that in a while. And then when, when Life is Strange came along, I thought, well, this is perfect for Chloe because what you're trying to do when you're writing characters from a certain region, you, you can do some research, or if you know, you can put that information in there and develop and give a kind of uh, realism or, to the characters or verisimilitude of realism. Little did I know that nobody says hella. I had no idea. And I, I found the response interesting because I would see in comments say, well, yeah, aside, nobody says hella. And it's from somebody in London. I would never assume to tell somebody in London, like, nobody says sus, nobody says that, nobody says brilliant. You know, I wouldn't know. I could research, I could find out, but I, I, I can't honestly say that I would know how somebody talks elsewhere in the world, and I certainly don't think teenagers talk in one way. I know they don't. I know they don't. And part of what was fun for writing Life is Strange is to, and, you know, I think the dialogue, whether you like it or you don't, it's its own, it's different. It's, 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 it's stylistically, it's true to what the game is. And so I think in this new blue age of storytelling, we're going to move towards more and more dialogue that's more and more like films and literature, which is, has a whole... Nobody talks like they do in Reservoir Dogs. Nobody talks like a Quentin Tarantino character in real life. Nobody. But we love the dialogue because it seems true in some ways, and it's clever. And that's why we go see movies. You see people talking better than we do or talking in a wittier way than we do. And if we want naturalism, which I love writing that too, then that depends on... It's, it's the medium, it's the form follows function. And so I felt very, very um, satisfied a year later when, you know, somehow Merriam-Webster's Dictionary added this word, even though nobody says it. But they do now. And, and I love the fact that around the world, I, people are saying hella because of life is strange. That, that's, the best, that's the best revenge possible. There's nothing better than that. And I want to skip this one. Yeah, I'm going to skip that other one because that's, that's a major spoiler and I actually don't want to give it away. And we're coming down to the, the wire here and I do want to take some questions. So I'm sorry I rushed through all this. So it seemed like when, I, when, I, when Brenda asked me to speak and she said, you're 45 minutes, I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to fill up that time? And when I was doing it, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I need two hours just to do this. But um, so hopefully I've given you just a little insight into what goes into the dialogue writing. And please, you can contact me on Twitter, online, and talk to me. I'm always available for questions, and I love answering questions, and I love talking to, to, to people. So to sum up briefly, the best gift for me from Life is Strange is not only the, you know, just the satisfaction of it responding with people around the world. It's just seeing people trying to take the high road when they make these choices. They don't make fun of Victoria. They try to get along with her. They actually, they want to always take the high road. And I, I was always shocked because I would often take the low road. And so I was very, you know, impressed. And, I, and I'll, I'm, I'm being very genuine here is that Life is Strange gives me hope for the future of young people. It really does. And people. Because I, I just love seeing people open up emotionally as I'm trying not to do right now. And many people have told me, and the, the director of the Peabody said, you know, Life is Strange is not a game. You know, it's, it's a photo that's not even me. It's another thing. I don't know what, what's going on with that. <laughs> could, I, could I put that back up there? Okay. I'm not clicking anything. I'm clicking, but nothing's going on. That's fine. You know what? It's actually fun because that's the last slide. Um, but, it's, but basically, somebody wrote, thank you for the game and the experience. And of course, it's a game. But the idea that it's so emotionally involving with people and it seems to take you know, the interactivity of games, this whole other emotional level, you know, always kind of you know, blew my mind. And that, to me, is the greatest gift of, of the game. And when I say the Blue Age, once again, it's just a theory. You know, but I really feel like we're moving towards this 
era of reflection, refraction, watching, 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 experiencing. I don't know where it's all going. I'm a, I'm a writer, so I'm a, I'm a cautionary writer too. So I never say everything is all good. I always say there's a flip side to everything, and people should be aware of the flip side to everything because you, you have to be aware. You have to really be aware. But I'm very aware of the game's success, and I'm very grateful for it, and I'm really grateful for all you coming today. So thank you very much for listening, and I love answering questions because then I can riff and not have to look down at all this bullshit. So any questions, please? I, I know everybody hates to be the first person. I love the first person to answer. Yeah. I'm not afraid of that. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, let me just put on that I love absolutely loved the game. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. Thank you. But I was, I, I was getting into the right in the middle of the game, so I think the first two or three episodes have been out, and I was still waiting for the next one, next one. And I felt the fifth one was very different to the rest. Uh, it felt more scripted, um, very slow, where I can very little interact. At the end, it made sense. But did you feel the fifth one was kind of different than the rest? Well, I mean, I, there's, you know, people talk about this. The, everything was scripted. I mean, there, nothing was changed. I mean, everything, the, 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 when, I, when I got the original episodes, the, Jean-Luc Cano, by the way, wrote the original story for Life is Strange. A uh, brilliant writer. And that was built into the, into the story. And when Michelle and Roll and the team put it together, that fifth episode was, that's what it was. It was always two choices. It was always built around, you know, these things. Now, of course, you always wish you had more time and more money to do more things, but what they wanted to do was what was in episode five. So I can only speak for, and I, and I, and it's a, it's a, it's a different episode because you're kind of wrapping everything up and you've got to make these amazing decisions. So, uh, you know, that's all I can say is that it's, it's, it's exactly what the team intended. Thank you for asking that question. Hello. Hello. Um, I wanted to know what was the design intention for the ending? One was longer than the other. Was there a preference for one or? No, no. I mean, seriously, we all we all thought, you know, it's there's no canon. It's the players. It's your choice. You you decide the canon. And once again, if you know one ending is short because that's the way they wanted it. You know, it's simply the way it worked out. And I, you know, that's. That's it. That's the end. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I love this game, and actually, I was really amazed by the, how uh, w I really felt uh, that I made a relationship with Chloe. Like I really felt that I had this strong friendship with her. And I want to ask you if you have any advice of how to create this uh, kind of emotional attachment uh, with the, uh, I mean, for games sure. uh, in, in players. Well, first have every character say hella. That's the number one thing. Just have them say <laughs> hella, obviously. Um, I mean, like I said, you have to give credit to Jean-Luc Cano who wrote the original story because their relationship was, you know, built in. And, and then when the script was ha handed over to me, the story to start, you know, drawing it out and giving it more American idiom. You know, I always watched my sister's friends growing up and I thought they always had such, you know, different relationships than my male friends who, were, you know, who we don't, you know, men are expected in America to be a lot more like emotionally secluded and not to be like, not to share their emotions. So I was always envious and jealous of my female friends, my sister's friends, because they could kind of, I don't know, they could hold hands, they could goof around and it was, didn't mean anything, it wasn't a thing, but they, they seemed to have this emotional, connection. I can't say how we do that and I can only speak, I, I approach the characters honestly just as characters first. Who are these people? I try not to look at them as anything else but who is the character and then you start from there and you, and you also treat the characters fairly and objectively which means if they do something that's wrong, let it, you know, work that into your story. If Max is not right to the game. There's t tons of moments where Max fucks up and she doesn't always do the right thing, but that's very human. That's, and I think that's why people respond to the game. And I, I, was, I was somewhat expecting people to say, well, you know, okay, dude writing these female characters, you know. But as a writer, once again, your job is to go into all these different worlds and make people believe that. But that's research. I believe strongly in research. But that's what I'm talking about, this cultural layering, is all these things kind of add 
you know, to the characters, their setting, the environment, the, the artist, the way they drew the characters tells you so much about the characters. I mean, immediately you look at Chloe, you know who Chloe is based on her, her look. You know who Max is somewhat based on her look. So it's not just voice and dialogue, it's, it's, it's how they look it's, and it's perception, how they view the world. Maybe the kind of music they listen to tells you a lot about a character, their politics. You know, things like that. David Matson, I grew up with a, you know, with a military dad, and he was not at all like David Matson, not brusque like that, but certain, had certain similarities. But I was not going to write a character that was a typical military asshole. That's an easy character to write. And I, I really try to make things not easy. Like, don't write the easy character. And don't write the glib character. Write the complicated character, even if it's just one little line. Like, every script I write, I give every minor character a name. I don't care. I never write man one, which you see in a lot of scripts, woman two. Child three. Give him a name. Give him one moment to have a little beat. And there's, you know, Tarantino does that well. I think Edgar Wright actually does that beautifully in Shaun of the Dead. That's a great example of a film where it gives characters you might not like. I was like, suddenly I was watching Shaun of the Dead. I'm crying. I'm like, what? It, you know, so, you know, things like that. Just always looking for outside of the character and what you can bring in to just give them more weight, more spiritual weight, more, you know, aesthetic weight. If Thanks. that helps. Um, it's going to be a technical question. Maybe okay. That, um, was it uh, difficult or very different from uh, other games to work on uh, Life is Strange uh, because of the um, time mechanic, like going back to going back in time to change your things? Was it different from a writing point of view? Well, I mean, in terms of it, just it means more writing. I mean, there's thirteen thousand lines in Life is Strange about. And only eight are hella, by the way. Um, so it's, that's a massive amount of writing. And so much of that is rewriting, having to write all new dialogue when you go back. And, you know, we were all doing this. We're all learning on the same learning curve, the team, because we've never done this before. And we never made a game like this before. Although, remember me, had this brilliant memory mix is what they pulled into Life is Strange. So, I mean, it was easy in the sense of, and once I got in the groove of it, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, complete opposite complete opposite, complete opposite. That really helped because then I knew it, you know, and the team knew, we all knew like, when we're, we're, we're going to veer off in these two choices, let's really veer off into these two choices. Even, even if there's no right choice, the more opposite you go, the more interesting the writing became and the more kind of narrative, narratively dramatic it became. So yeah, it was difficult, but in the end, it became really second nature to what we were doing. Thanks okay. for the question. Thanks. Do you have another? Is that? Okay. Uh, hi. Um, hi. First, I'd like to say that I'm just really glad to have experienced the game. Thank you. It's the first feeling I had about it is like, I'm just glad. <laughs> um, my question is, um, since I understood, uh, as I understood, you came into the project when uh, a lot of things were already set, yep. like the broad story and everything. Did you, ever, did you ever feel limited? Were there any moments where you felt like you want to do things and might not be possible? How did you deal with it? How did the team deal with it, your wishes? Well, I said I'm an American, so we do what we want. So they had to listen <laughs> to me. You know. um, the, it was so. It was the most freedom I've ever had writing, and I like I said, we, I've never been on a, a team where everybody was so much on the same page. When I met, interviewed Michelle and Raul and Luke, and they said they wanted the game to be subtle, I was like. What, what did you just say? Did you just say the word subtle? That is a word you will never hear in Hollywood. You will never hear maybe, it's very, it's not a word that people like to use because it means quiet and not obvious and not explosive. So when they said that we want this to be subtle, and then they were, think, they were thinking, well, you know, because this, because Max has got these powers, the game has got to be like, and I said, like magical realism, and they go, yes. And I, that's actually when I knew I was going to get the game. <laughs> Because magical realism is, in a way, what the, the story is about and the experience is about. But no, I, I always felt like, I felt, and, and Michelle and would always say, feel free, to, feel free, feel free. I heard that more than anything. Feel free, feel free to do this, feel free to do this. And they really trusted me because, you know, I'm bringing a lot of America and they trusted me to do that. So, and, and there are times when, trust me, there are, I really... Um, there were times when you have debates, and you know, you're as the writer, you're you're working for the designers. I mean, that's your job. You, that's they have the vision, and you're you share the vision, and you're making sure that you're putting their vision 
into the game. So I never felt limited because I, w I believed in what they were doing, and I was very happy to be part of that engine. And the only thing, the big fight we had is, uh, I can't even tell you. <laughs> I don't, spoiler alert, but we had, but fortunately the French do like to debate, which is fantastic, so do I. But they're not mad debates, they're just like, da 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 like, okay. And then it goes on. So no, I, I felt amazing freedom, so much so that I'm, I'm scared for the future. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the future. I don't know too much about your career. I haven't played um, Life is Strange, although it's on my to-do list. I hope um, so. Oh, I've got it. Like Good. The limited edition box. I bought it brand new. First day, still sealed. Um, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, you, you set up to how you want to get back into games. Obviously, Life is Strange was one of your first projects. Um, what did you learn from your um, gaming, writing-related experience that you can take on board with regards to your future projects and at the same time what advice would you give to aspiring writers who also want to break into the gaming field well what i i guess what i learned from writing on life is strange is i learned that you can write this kind of game i wanted to write this kind of game in the 90s i wanted to do this kind of not necessarily exactly this game but i wanted to have characters have conversations that were more naturalistic and tangential and not have cartoony voices which really bugs me to this day. It's why I can't stand watching, I don't watch any anime dubs because Americans are always like, arr, 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 and the Japanese are always like soft and they, they speak naturally, but Americans always have this car Saturday morning cartoon sense. Not so much anymore, obviously. It's, it's changed much, but there's still this air of like actors have to always go over the top. So I just learned that you can actually put together, you know, everything that you actually believe in and feel like you're skilled at into a game and have it work. Now, that's just my own, per that's my own story. And, and what I love about writing, as far as advice for writers, the most amazing thing, and I, I lived in LA for 10 years and I wrote for nonfiction magazines for years and I still do because I love nonfiction. I teach about genres and film and I do film presentations. And, and all, my, when I came to LA, my small writing group were, you know, were just a group of us. And then within five years, 10 years, my friend Kirker is a producer on The Family Guy. My friend Matt, who started the group, creates the show Burn Notice. My friend Jen writes a book called How to Be a Badass. It's on the New York Times bestseller list today. My other friend Chris Rossi writes a movie called Meadowland. My friend Anna Kaja is in Silicon Valley and TV shows. So the, most, the biggest advice that I have for writers is, A, write. You have to write. You have to write. You, you have to put the work in. Don't half-ass it because you're not going to get far. Because there's 10 other people that are going to be writing a lot more than you if you think you're going to just do it like... I mean, you have, to, you have to be passionate about it. And I tell people all the time, like, you know what? If you're going to be an artist, you're not going to listen to me. And that's going to make you an artist. You're not going to listen to anybody tell you no. You're going to believe in it. And you can't be like, oh, maybe I want to. I just say, you know what? If you have that feeling, you better stop now because you're going to give up at some point. And, 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 and the cruelty of the, of the universe, of this aesthetic universe, is that you will be crushed you know, by a lot of rejection. You have to deal with rejection and you have to embrace it. Because what I learned when I got the, well, I'm glad you asked that, because when I got Life is Strange, I felt like, wow, this came at a time when I didn't think it was coming, and I can't believe it came, but I realized that my entire life built up to that moment. All my acceptances, all my rejections, all my triumphs, all my tragedies, everything led to me getting the game at that moment, and I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change, I, I, if I could go back in time and be born with another hand, I wouldn't do it. Because I may not be up here today. That may be the thing that gives me a certain objectivity as a writer, that I can look into other people's viewpoints and, and empathize. So I, you know, I think passion is the, is, the, is the main thing to have. Yeah. Well, the game community is very. Oh, I mean, they're 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 changing too. They want these two games too, and I, I I'm so happy with where where games are going. I mean, look at I mean her story in The Last of Us. I mean, it's just 
it's just so, and no man's sky is it's like that's like uh, that's my jam like 70s style science fiction looking paperback covers as a game yeah sign me up it's cool you know i love the fact that the, all these new aesthetics are coming and that's really important don't like make your disadvantage your advantage don't worry about the big budget focus on what you can do and that and every i tell every writer once again your point of view is your gift nobody sees the world like you and that is your biggest gift and so don't worry about what they're doing don't and yes you can copy people early on and that's what you do you copy and you you intake it and then you put it out and then you start merging with your own personality hopefully so you know always try you know believe in your pov because that's really you know how, you know how you'll change things in terms of the you know game community they embrace the game immediately as far as you know other people play the game you can go online and <laughs> and find both points of view so anybody else we're done thank you so much and i'll talk to you out there <laughs>